Google just announced a massive update to their Gemini multimodal AI, and it might have something to do with a leaked internal model named Goose that definitely has nothing to do with Top Gun. So even though Google definitely goosed their last demo of Gemini, to make it look like it was actually capable of doing wild multimodal things with post-its, is Gemini 1.5 Pro, at least in the form of this research preview, really everything that Google is promising? Is it actually a next generational change in their AI? And will it finally help Google get over the fact that they fumbled the ball by releasing their Transformers architecture open source and letting basically everyone else trying to do AI get ahead of them in the process? Welcome to AI Flux, let's get into it. So today, Jeff Dean tweeted that Gemini 1.5, at least in the form of a research preview, was released. He's the chief scientist at Google DeepMind and Google Research, and was actually one of the initial implementers of TensorFlow, which is now used by millions of people to build AI. Gemini 1.5 Pro, for a few specific reasons, looks to be incredible. It hits when it comes to coding. It hits when it comes to talking to documents or movies. It has one of the largest context windows that has ever been seen in a working model. And in theory, it was all trained on TPUs. So it also shows that Google is now really proving out that you can train mixture of experts models on TPUs which previously was not considered to be something that was a great option. So Jeff has a great synopsis here. I'm going to skim it and highlight a few things and then also go into why I think this recently leaked internal model Goose from Google also might have some big implications in Gemini 1.5 in terms of its coding abilities. So basically they said here, Gemini 1.5 Pro is a highly capable multimodal model with a 10 million token context length. And we'll get into kind of what that turns into in terms of pages of documents or minutes of video. So they say, today we are releasing the first demonstrations of the capabilities of the Gemini 1.5 series with the Gemini 1.5 Pro model. One of the key differences of this model is its incredibly long context length, supporting millions of tokens of multimodal input. The multimodal capabilities of the model means you can interact in sophisticated ways with books, documents, etc. Uh, that also includes video and code. So this was a collaboration with Google DeepMind, Google Research, and just Google generally. So it's cool to see cross-pollination there. I'll link to the main blog post below, but I really like the kind of initial report given here by Jeff. And there are also some great analysis of its coding capabilities and long context length, starting with understanding the entire 3JS code base, which is a JavaScript library used for visualizing graphs and charts and building animations. They also had it look at a silent movie that was 45 minutes long and an entire Apollo 11 transcript. And right now, if you want to use it, I'm already signed up for this, but it says we're offering a limited preview of 1.5 Pro to developers and enterprise customers via AI Studio and Vertex AI. I haven't been given access yet, but hopefully I'll get this in the next few days. They also say here that they'll introduce a 1.5 Pro with a standard 128,000 token context window when the model is ready for a wider release. They said it's coming soon, but we don't really know when that is. And what's curious curious is they say that the standard 128,000 context window will scale up to a million tokens as the model improves, which is curious because they mentioned that it has a 10 million token context length up here, but it looks like we can't use that full context size yet. So why is this model so incredible? There are a few really cool ways to show this. So one of the cool ways that Google has kind of stuck to and that we've seen from a few other multimodal models is what is called a needle in a haystack test. So obviously everyone knows kind of the, the fable about this that you know it's hard to find a needle in a haystack. The idea with LLMs doing this, multimodal or otherwise, is that you're giving them kind of something to find in a large set of input tokens. So it's basically a way to see, given a context length, how granular and how accurate a model is at finding something. And what's interesting here is you can see there are three different haystacks. So there's a video, audio, and text haystack to cover the different multimodal elements. Right now, uh, we don't have hyperspectral as a modal for these, in theory, that could be video, but yeah, we just have these three for now. And what you'll see here is any green box is a successful retrieval and the red is when it failed. And basically uh, this is a chart where the hardest context, right, would be at a high depth all the way through the movie, because in certain cases, context to the farther end is sometimes weighted with less importance. And that's a challenge of making these models and training them properly. And as you can see, uh, there's basically over a 99.7% recall with this, which is crazy. I have never seen a test with active recall this high, especially with a context length this large. So really, really cool. So this kind of progress is amazing to see. And the next is when they try to understand or basically feed in the entire code base of 3JS, which is a JavaScript library that comprises of about 100,000 lines of code. It's important to note that coding models and language models, they react and kind of 
interact with content very differently. So if you use, for instance, the form of GPT-4 coder or you know, the, the, the GPT-4 variants that are meant for coding, they, you'll know that like they understand prose kind of differently and they give you responses that are again, quite different. So they say here that with this code base in context, the system can help a user understand the code and make better modifications to complex demonstrations based on high level human specs. Basically saying, if you understand more of the code base, you can respond to more complex prompts asking an LLM to tell you how to do something. And right now, GPT-4 can give you kind of a relatively good idea of how to create a very basic boilerplate, but it's not really good enough to give you something that, for instance, could give you a very complex diagram or a complex visualization or animation. And 3JS is a great option here because there's just so much you can do with it. It's not, you know, just like stringing one API to another. It's a really complex library. So very cool to see here. And this further gets into navigating large and unfamiliar code bases. So they're really liking these code related examples Examples. And one reason why I think this goose model might have something to do with this is why it was built and what it was trained on and really what its purpose is. So for those of you who don't know, big tech companies build a lot of their own tools. Um, for instance, Amazon and Google, they don't really use GitHub. They have their own tools for code tracking, uh, code changes, and pulling all of, of their code onto the internet. I will say Google does this significantly better than most of these other tech companies. And since Google has some, some of the most developers working on a wide variety of things, they actually have a repository of every change that's ever been made to Google's code, whether it's improving something or whether it's something that caused issues. And that's an incredibly powerful data set. So the idea is Google thought, well, if we're doing all this coding to improve efficiency, why wouldn't we try doing that internally? And that's in theory, from what we know now, what Goose was created for. So Goose is an internal large language model designed to make employees more productive. It was trained on 25 years of this sort of engineering history at Google that was purely code. And I would argue that code changes in many ways are more valuable to this kind of a model than just code because you understand what's better, what's worse, what is good practice, what is bad practice. And in theory, like they wanted to keep this internal because you know obviously you wouldn't want someone outside of Google being able to understand how all of Google was built. Because in theory, this model has more understanding and context of software at Google than any one software engineer at Google, which is really saying something. And this is also part of Google in a greater way trying to just increase productivity in general since they slashed thousands of jobs in the last 13 months. And it's kind of ironic that Google is dog fooding their own AI and in the process actually laying off a bunch of really, really high paid software engineers. Right now, we're pretty sure that Goose is available for some employees, but not everyone. And what's interesting is we do know that Goose has been described internally as something that's planned to be the first general purpose LLM for internal coding use at Google. Uh, what I will say is Goose is a, it's a less advanced model than Gemini 1.5 because it only has a purported 28,000 token context window, which makes it great as a coding assistant, but maybe not something that can work at a scale like Gemini can now. It's likely this has been worked on for you know, more than a year, so it's also not too surprising that obviously Gemini is a bit more leading edge. And obviously Microsoft is also using Copilot internally with their teams. They've been more public about this. And we also know that DeepMind has been used for some really wild thing, at least in terms of increasing data center efficiency and more kind of hard problems within Google's business. So back to Gemini. So navigating large and unfamiliar code. I'm sure there were feedback or there was some kind of result from Goose that was put into this. And they give us a few different coding examples. In this case, the model is able to ingest an entire 116 file JAX code base. And that was around 746,000 tokens and help a user identify a specific spot in code that implements a backwards pass for auto differentiation. So obviously this model is capable of understanding very complex attributes of code and then giving you specific pointers about it, which is really hard to do. Like as an engineer, this is something that you would go to a more experienced engineer to speed up troubleshooting. And I think a really big advantage of these models in terms of software engineering is that it, they'll reduce a lot of load where people just have to keep context or just keep things in their head and um, specifically reduce kind of siloed knowledge and having one person spend too much of their time actually just dumping knowledge to help others improve productivity than working on their own stuff. So the idea that you could have kind of an AI in the background keeping track of everything and kind of helping answer those questions would help people learn faster, it would help things get done faster, and it would also mean that the time for your most talented engineers was always focused on forward-facing 
productive tasks. And if you've ever been someone who's dove into a really unfamiliar code base, this is a really common problem. So it's cool to see that this is as capable as it is. Basically by being accurate down to the point that it can just give you a line of code to look at for exactly what you're looking for. So another thing that Gemini 1.5 Pro is really good at is actually reasoning with video. So analyzing video is another great capability brought by the fact that Gemini models are what Google is calling naturally multimodal. And this becomes even more compelling with log context, which just means you can feed more video in and the model can reason more with it. So you can talk with this model about entire movies or entire TV shows end to end. So it's kind of like having your own movie critic or having someone who can help you recall a really specific part of a film that's super specific. Even talking about really subtle plot attributes and parts of the story. Now, the biggest feature of this entire model that I think has been understated is reasoning about long text documents. So RAG has been a really popular topic for quite some time on the open source front, which is the idea that you can feed a PDF or you can feed a portion of a transcribed book into a model and then have it basically be able to just respond to you when you ask questions about it. So this can be for technical things, this can be for just stories in general. It would have been great if I had this in high school when I had to do papers on what happened in a book that I hadn't really read yet. And what's cool is this model is really good at this. So one of the tests they did was feeding in all of Victor Hugo's five volume novel, Les Misrables, which was about 1400 pages, which equated to 732,000 tokens. And the multimodal capabilities demonstrated by Google, by Google's Gemini are pretty incredible. And What's also funny is you can actually feed it in a drawing and then ask where this might have something to do in the book. And what's interesting is, yeah, you can totally do that. And it came back with, yes. He stepped into the, ch into the chimney piece, took two silver candlesticks and brought them to Jean Valjean. And so, yeah, it's kind of funny that you can actually feed in long context, prompt it with an image but of stick people and then have it understand basically exactly what you mean. Now, the other really cool thing here is when they fed it an entire context of an Apollo 11 transcript, which was, you know, obviously not the easiest thing. And it was able to still extract a lot of cool context and things that, you know, others would maybe not have to get ha having to listen through this entire thing. Now we've made other videos about models that are capable of translating between hundreds of different languages. So what's interesting is right now, Gemini is capable of translating between a number of different languages. What's cool is they've actually trialed this trying to save a nearly dead language called um, Kalamang, which actually is spoken by native people in New Guinea and parts of Indonesia. And what's cool is this is a language that's currently spoken by fewer than 200 people. In sort of a Star Trek-esque way, they've actually been able to store most of the rules and just essence of this language into Gemini. So now, in theory, this will be preserved for as long as this is stored in Google servers. And in closing, again, the needle in the haystack tests for this model are completely insane. And if you wanna see more about this, I recommend looking at their tech report, which I'll link below. And what's crazy here is, at least for text, Gemini 1.5 Pro was able to have a 100% recall of up to 530 tokens and 99.7% for up to a million tokens and still over 99% for up to 10 million tokens, which is crazy. And this is insane because this is a comparison of what GPT-4 Turbo can do, which, in my opinion, is about the same speed as Gemini 1.5 Pro. And it's a really underserved advantage of Gemini in general, I think, is that its speed and just usability, I think, is not vastly better, but is significantly better in terms of user experience than GPT-4. And you can see it here with this diagram in that GPT-4 falls off past around 128,000 tokens. So even with their new features of extending its memory or extending its context length with sort of some hack together improvements, Gemini 1.5 Pro is delivering. And the next question is to see if Google can really scale this and deploy it as a product as well as OpenAI has done with GPT-4. Because as we know, outages are never fun and there are a lot of reasons why this is kind of interesting. For me, I use Perplexity. I think it's a cheaper, better option to use all these different models. They do not sponsor me. And I still honestly believe you should just use Perplexity. Um, if you have a GPT-4 subscription, ironically, you still get access to everything GPT-4 does as part of having a Perplexity subscription. I'm curious what you guys think about Gemini 1.5. 
I'm pretty blown away by it. I'm hoping I get a chance to actually try this out in the next few days. Let me know what you think in the comments below. As always, I hope you learned something. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, and share, and I'll see you in the next one.